to welcome you to this policy exchange event, um, looking at uh, basically how we uh, start up large-scale businesses in Britain and why it is we historically haven't managed to produce the, the future uh, Apples and uh, Googles. There's a, long, there's a long story here behind that, and we're going to try and unpack it and uh, explore it. My name is Warwick Lightfoot. I'm the uh, Director of Research at Policy Exchange, and I'm also head of the Economics and Social Policy uh, Unit. We have a very uh, good panel to help us with this today. Uh, Chaya Mora, who I hope is going to actually join us, but she's actually harassed and other uh, events elsewhere, both before she comes here and when she goes afterwards. So we'll play it by ear with her, and she'll be very welcome when she uh, comes. Um, our supporters who are helping us with this today are the L London Stock Exchange, and the uh, Marcus uh, Stuttard is going to kick it off and try and shape the debate for us and sort of set our cap straight and how we perhaps could approach uh, thinking of this uh, uh, set of issues. Martin Mateig um, is the National Policy Director for the Federation of Small Businesses and has a lot of direct experience of starting businesses, running businesses in engineering, IT, and actually getting institutional investors uh, on board. So he's not just one of those... Um, how can I put it, public affairs specialist who's good at talking about it. He's actually uh, done a bit of the, uh, the fisticuffs uh, around running businesses himself. And Giles Palmer, the CEO of Brandwatch, is actually um, doing the business. He's actually starting the smallest company and actually taking it forward. And he's actually complaining there are too many members of the Labour Party here in Brighton uh, because his business is based in Brighton. And he wants to get people over here at the moment and he's having to pay too much for the hotel rooms. Um, so, Chuck. Uh, so it, it's, it's very good to have someone who is actually a local business based on the uh, s south coast of uh, uh, England actually scaling up. It's exactly the sort of business that ministers would give their eye teeth to actually have uh, uh, around. So uh, he's living the life, and I hope it's a dream and not a nightmare. Joe, um, I thank you very much for coming. I'm very conscious that you have your hands full, and you, and you may have to actually leave us a little bit brisk, brisk. I do, I'm afraid. No, well, do, uh, don't, don't worry, we, we, we'll very much play it uh, by ear. Thank I, you, I have my hands full and my battery pack going, but never mind. No. <laughs> um, the, um, I think it would be very helpful if Marcus could actually set the scene for us about what the challenges are. Okay. Um, with this, you could all hear, yeah, yeah, you could all see, you're happy with us doing it sitting down? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Um, and if you can't hear, just just let me know. Um, I mean, just I mean, in terms of setting the scene, um, it, you might sort of ask, if, you know, for startup and scale-up businesses, you know, what's what's the involvement of London Stock Exchange? Because a lot of people, you know, actually just think about public markets as being just about the largest companies, the FTSE 100. We hear a lot about the FTSE 100, the FTSE 250. But actually, you know, we feel very strongly that um, the public capital markets at the top of the funding ladder or uh, chain are important right the way through to start-up businesses. So London Stock Exchange, to give you a bit of context, we operate not just our sort of main market that people associate with the largest global stocks. Um, I'm also head of, of our growth market, AIM, where we have stocks from you know, tens of millions of pounds up to companies like ASOS valued at four and a half billion. And actually, Warwick, I mean, you sort of talked about as not being able to generate unicorns or billion dollar plus businesses. You know, you, ASOS is a great example of a company that was originally floated at 25 million and is now valued at four and a half billion. So, you know, and there, there have been plenty of examples, you know, Arm, for example, um, that have done it. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, you mentioned in the, in the, the overview, you know, there are references to some of the world's largest and most visible companies, the Amazons, the Googles. And you know, there's no coincidence that these are public businesses. Um, and, and it tends to be the public companies that have the highest profile and visibility. Um, and this actually creates a very aspirational role to <laughs> entrepreneurs from you know, very much the, the startup phase. One of the things about the UK is that we've been historically very, very good at creating startups. You know, we've got one of the highest populations of startup businesses in this country. We've got some of the world's leading universities, some of the best 
intellectual property and innovation. I think you know, actually over the last 20 years or so, we've, we've got a much better um, environment for entrepreneurship generally. But what we don't have yet is businesses going from startup right the way through to scale up and, and lots of those to become the next generation of large companies. And I think there are two fundamental sets of problems. One is the access to finance. You know, actually we've got some very good startup finance initiatives. Actually, you know, a number of governments, you know, including you know, Labour, Tories, have supported you know, a number of tax incentives, reliefs, things like EIS, the Venture Capital Trust schemes, that have really helped to encourage um, startup businesses to get early stage finance. But there seems to be a gap in between those businesses and the largest. You know, we know that some of the biggest insurers have got over a trillion pounds worth of, of assets on their balance sheets. We know that the largest corporates have got you know, over 500 billion pounds sat on their balance sheets, but it's not getting invested into um, scale-up businesses. So I think we've still got a problem of matching some of the scale-ups with the capital. But then I think the other parallel track is is actually around education and knowledge. I think for a lot of the management teams and entrepreneurs, they tend to be you know, so focused on the day-to-day -day running of their business that actually they quite often don't know where to go for support, for advice, and for very independent, sort of candid um, advice about the different forms of finance, you know, the difference between debt finance, between equity finance. We know that amongst the universe of um, you know, scale-up businesses, over 50% we would classify as permanent non-borrowers. And these are businesses that would rather not take external finance and accept that they're going to grow at a slower rate than, than take on external finance. But we also know that those businesses that do take on external finance, whether that's debt or equity in its various forms, grow at a very significantly faster rate. So I think we've still got a bigger job to do to signpost what the different forms of finance are and to target that support and advice. And you know, I know through a programme that we've been running called Elite, where and you know, that's where you know, we, we first met uh, Brandwatch and Giles, that actually you know, companies and management teams that hear more about the different options and have the, the appropriate level of support often go on to scale their businesses very effectively. So I would say they're the two parallel sets of challenges, just to kick off this now, evening. Now that's uh, very, very helpful. Uh, Chai, would you like to go next? Because um, I'm conscious you've got a oh. time constraint, so rather than no, no, have no, you no, sort no. of worrying, you know. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and thanks very much for inviting me here, and I'm really sorry that I have to uh, leave this, uh, this conf conference. I'm very pleased to say um, there is a real appetite and interest in the two areas, if you like, which I'm absolutely passionate about and which I've worked all my life in, which is tech and politics. Uh, and uh, the question that you're putting today, um, why has um, the UK got no, uh, not got a Google? It's a really simple question, which obviously is why, it's, like, that's why you chose it, but it has quite a number of different sort of answers, complex answers, because it is about um, the in our our um, economic uh, business skills and finance and competitive um, environment. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about three about three things: finance skills in market um, market size engagement and awareness. And so when it comes to finance, uh, yes, we have um, we have we have a problem with finance. You know and. It, We've had it. We've had it for a long time. There's many different initiatives to try and get and get address it. There is. Um, I recommend the work of um, Mariana Matsukato, uh, looking at the fa the the financing of uh, tech businesses and particularly how some of the um, the, the profits often from certain tech businesses are taken abroad they're not able to be recycled into the into the into the real economy that is true that's true globally what we have to have in this country specifically what government can do is to ensure more access to long term patient uh, finance capital and what we have promised to do through our national investment bank which will be at a national investment bank but 250 billion but it will be regional it'll have regional um, 
offices which will take decisions locally. And that will really, um, that should, I think that will make a step difference in the fine availability of finance regionally. Because I know as a Newcastle MP, we have fantastic startups, you know, but, you know, our capital, our capital funding comes mainly from European Union, our venture capital comes mainly from European Union funding. Uh, which is going, obviously, um, and uh, we definitely need something to support that and to support the scale-up part of, of the businesses. Skills is a huge prob is a huge issue. I mean, the, the one, uh, we have a skills gap, it's partially because we have a, um, a diversity challenge. You know, if there was a more women and more ethnic minorities, more working class people in tech, then that would address a huge part of our skills gap. But it's also because we need more access to easier access to lifelong learning and training. I know people who <laughs> wish they'd made um, you know, different decisions and they can't get, you can't get free training or education in this country after the age of 24. So we will be setting up a national <coughs> education system free at the point of demand for lifelong education. And finally, um, market, access to the market, understanding the market, the size of the market. Now, the European Union is a fantastic, sorry, I mean, it's a fantastic market. It's a big market, it's as big as, I mean, one of the, you know, scale comes from having a large, being able to have, address and access a large market. And we need to secure continued access to a market, you know, one of the world's sort of biggest market of the richest people. But businesses also need to know how to access that market. And we have totally, almost completely lost business support. You know, bus uh, government-funded business support, and I know that um, you know universities, Newcastle University, other universities, trying to address that uh, gap. But I think we need to look at ways of you know delivering better business support for access to technology, to skills, and to export export in new market support. So I'll, I'll stop there. But there's lots of other things as well. But I think those are the three main ones. That's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, why doesn't um, Giles go next in terms of actually doing it all practically and having, having your pleasures and pains, so to speak? <coughs> sure thing. Uh, afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, Brandwatch is a, uh, as Robert was saying, is a local company. It started here in Brighton, me and some friends, uh, who all came out of Sussex University. And uh, we won a contract to build a search engine uh, from local government. And we took that seed and we thought, what's happening? This was 2006, what's happening in the world? And we could see the, the kind of emergence of social media. And we thought, uh, kind of inspired by a book called The Clue Train Manifesto, which is a kind of a, a really nice little book which talks about markets as conversations we realized that there was this big conversation going on in the internet um, and companies were not aware of what was being said about them and their products and their services. So we turned our search engine into a monitoring tool so that companies could <coughs> understand how their customers and their prospects felt about them and hopefully improve their products and services uh, for the benefit of all. So it's like a search engine but with language analysis so we kind of tell anybody from large corporations like Unilever and Bank of America to agencies and medium-sized businesses um, what the sentiment is around them their brand uh, their competition all around the world in about 50 or 60 languages so we started off like that that was the uh, seed of the idea um, uh, we got a bit of seed seed capital kind of half a million pounds from friends and family and and um, kind of an affiliated group to to the to the government um, and we went to work and built built the first version of the product and we shipped it in August 2007 so it's 10 years old uh, and back in that those days we were <coughs> very scrappy kind of six or seven eight people um, in a room about this size with one window um, crappy computers not pay very much and there were times when I was looking at our financials and looking forwards and thinking, holy shit, we're not going to be able to do payroll in three or four months' time. And we were saved on at least one, I think two occasions, by um, uh, what is called um, R&D tax credits, <laughs> which yeah. is a very unglamorous thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> many of you might not have heard of it, but it allows you to take the losses of a company 
and claim them against uh, payments that you've made for national insurance. So you basically get a rebate on your losses. So a, a company, as it makes losses, uh, can then carry those losses forwards against future profits and reduce the future profits and pay less tax. That's the way it works. Uh, so the government decided to actually bring this forward and allow companies to get a bit of an early payment. And I remember in 2008, we had about £110,000 uh, paid back by HMRC. <laughs> Never had that before. Um, and that saved our bacon. Um, and then we started to get what in tech land is called product market fit, where actually people buy our product and carry on buying it. It's a subscription service. Um, and so we, we, we started doing kind of t tens of thousands of, of pounds a month in revenue, which was great. Um, and then, and so we're just working our asses off for three or four years. And then in 2010, a company came along and said, we really like what you're doing. We like your data. We want to invest a million pounds into you. So we said, uh, that sounds like a nice idea. Um, uh, at that point, um, uh, our back end, our infrastructure was beginning to fall apart. So we really needed the money. And we took that million pounds as equity investment, invested it, carried on growing the company. 2012, we were doing about 280,000 pounds a month. Uh, and we thought, right, we want to go into the US. Um, and, it, and to do that, we were just about break even. We weren't making any profit, but we were reinvesting everything that we were making into development. Uh, we thought, we'll, we'll raise some venture capital. So I, uh, I went and start, started looking on, I bought a book, uh, which was like, all the VCs in Europe, and I just <laughs> called them all up or emailed them and got a whole bunch of meetings uh, and went and pitched. And after a couple of months, uh, I started to realize I was really crap at pitching. Um, but actually, the act of pitching helped me dramatically improve our story. And I figured out, you know, what the I needed to be more aggressive in my plans, I needed to be more optimistic, I needed to sh get rid of the kind of the scared entrepreneur that was going to run out of money in three months and be painting this big picture. So the first lesson that uh, I think Americans do better than us, coming back to the Google thing, is that they are amazing at suspending belief and telling a story which um, which uh, basically ends up in normally the, the word a billion. And of course, um, <coughs> for me, saying uh, we're going to be worth a billion dollars when we were, you know, turning over three million was just like insanity. So I was, I couldn't do it. So. So I guess a lesson that I had was you can stretch your optimism to a, to a, lev to a point uh, until it starts to break with your core beliefs. And at that point, you should stop because then you start losing credibility. But Americans seem to be able to stretch their belief <laughs> more, than, more than us Brits. Um, I think that's actually because of the size of the market and because so many of them actually have succeeded. And so there is, well, he's done it, she's done it, why can't I? Anyway, so uh, we managed to get a bit of uh, VC money. Um, 4 million euros and it was from a Spanish fund and we, we opened in the US, we carried on going and I, I won't tell that that was in 2012 and over the last five years um, we've carried on going, we've taken on another 40, 40 million dollars in funding. The company is now almost 400 people and this year we'll do 50 million dollars in, in revenues or 40 million pounds. So it's been, uh, it's been quite, quite a uh, quite a you know from s sitting here and looking back 10 years oh it's just been a nice a nice ride but not not a bit of it there's been plenty of existential moments where we thought we're not going to make it or our competition are going to crush us or we opened up in America and one of the guys resigns and we're completely screwed or or what's happened in the last two years is coming to the scale up thing moving from a startup to a scale up my kind of two or three kind of um, colleagues who were growing the business with me really reached the end of their to be to be blunt useful life in this in the company as it was and they called it themselves one of them the the, the CTO chief Techn technology officer basically was running a team of 120 people and he's a developer and he's like, I don't want to be running a team of 120 people. I want to be developing stuff I don't want to be a manager um, so we brought in a professional manager to run that team. Uh, the guys that were our sales guys had, you know, had started selling very young and, and had grown up with a company, but none of them had run uh, anything like what we got to. So we had to bring in somebody to run revenues globally. We brought in somebody to do products. So I've re and a new f uh, CFO um, with a view to um, hopefully going um, public sometime in the next couple of years. So, so the real challenge for going to startup to scale up is 
it's a different set of competencies needed at, at the kind of the senior level to actually make that happen. So that's the kind of that's the journey, and I'm happy to dig in on any of that stuff. One thing I will say about why we why we haven't got any unicorns or whatever horrible phrase people use uh, is uh, something that somebody said to me the other day, which is <coughs> entrepreneurs in the UK. Um, actually, I've got two points. Mate. Entrepreneurs in the UK um, tend to get to a certain point, maybe my point, as it were, and then they sell out and they buy uh, a rectory in a Porsche, um, uh, which I actually bought a fucking rectory last year. So I don't have a Porsche, and I'm not planning on getting a Porsche. But I thought, shit, I'm the cliche that everybody else is as well. But I think it comes down to actual ambition and and what it is that motivates you fundamentally. And, and, and I'm not really money motivated. I mean, obviously, you can't be an entrepreneur without having some degree of desire to be successful, and money is the benchmark, as it were. So, so to ignore it is ridiculous. Um, however, for me, it's not the primary driver. The primary driver is, is building a great business and, and surrounding myself with, with amazing people and watching them grow and taking the joy from from going from zero to one and creating something. That for me is the most wholesome and enjoyable part of what I'm doing. And um, when that stops happening, then maybe we'll sell the company or maybe I'll hand on to somebody else. But I think it comes down to ambition um, uh, is, the, is the underlying driver as to why we've got fewer, um, fewer large organizations than the Americans because they tend to be more ambitious. They tend to think in billions and not millions. Um, just to, again, use a, use a, use a financial benchmark. Um, uh, and then one other thing I'll say is I'm so uh, impressed with the improving quality of, of British entrepreneurs over the last 20 years. So I graduated from university in 1990, and most of my friends and colleagues went into um, safer, reasonably high-paying jobs, um, very few of them went off and started a business. Now, I think the internet changed the opportunity landscape, but back then, for me, entrepreneurs, raw entrepreneurs, people that would just go off and start something, tended to be kind of a bit odd. Misfits. You know? Misfits, your creative geniuses, so on and so forth. You tended more to see people that would come out of organizations by the time they got to, say, 40, and they'd do a spin-out. So it's not really what I would call pure entrepreneurship, like start something just for the hell of it. But that's changed, and now being an entrepreneur is seen as a genuine career path and something to be aspired to. Um, so I'm massively optimistic about UK PLC entrepreneurship in the next 10, 20 years. Well, that, uh, that actually rings completely true with um, my own experiences of the UK labour market over, over many years. Um, certainly 30 years ago, people would actually talk about uh, young people entering the labour market and whether they should even be bothering to actually uh, work as civil servants or uh, in a bank or trying to become solicitors because they were kind of misfits. And maybe you should actually try and start a business. Yeah. And that was the, the sort of um, uh, job of last resort uh, for, mm -hmm. r rather than something you would actually say to your son and daughter, uh, hey, come on, I think you could actually do it. You yeah. want to give it a try. Very different in the US. Yeah. Very different. Over to the Federation Small Business. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, follow that. I mean, he's... Charles's inspirational story really um, points for me why I'm involved in the FSB. I mean, we are, we are 160,000 small businesses across the UK, and um, sometimes this story gets a bit dominated by what Charles called unicorns, as various descriptions of them. You know, these fast growing businesses that are often uh, almost growing at a ridiculous Le on sustainable level in an early stage of their their uh, evolution and we think there's a big pipeline of businesses and certainly um, that are capable of what is described as modest growth but actually you know 10 percent year-on-year growth is by no means modest it's five times the typical GDP and if if everybody or a big chunk of those businesses started to grow at that rate, it would make a massive difference to this country's mm. economy. Mm. You know, uh, I think Charlie Mayfield's doing, recently done some great work on this, and he estimates that it's actually worth 130 billion to the UK economy if we could just get more companies to raise their ambitions slightly. 
so what what holds them back well we've we've talked about capital um and i think the problem and charles illustrated in some ways when he when he did his sort of review of you know going down the directory of ca uh, venture capitalists i mean a lot of small businesses don't know where to go they're not aware of the options there's um very very low take up of equity finance it's less than one percent of all the investment in small businesses is equity finance so we've got a really big knowledge shortfall that we have to address and there's also quite a big regional imbalance i know she all know this in so much as the level of investment or equity finance investment drops off dramatically the further north you go as soon as you get outside the sort of london stroke southeast it drops off dramatically and that's another area where there are ambitious uh, well, uh, well motivated uh, entrepreneurs in other parts of the country that need need that kind of infrastructure, but there's no getting away from it. Uh, leadership and management skills are absolutely core to this, and the um, I think if we could get more people interested in external finance and then bring investors that could mentor, I think that would make a difference because it's it does make a, a step change in the sort of performance of the, the management team. It's worth remembering that half of businesses in the UK, small business startups, fail within three years. So, you know, although we're brilliant at starting businesses, we don't seem to get past this sort of infancy stage. And there's a long uh, tail of underperforming businesses. <laughs> Our research showed that 50% of small businesses do little or no management training, virtually none. So that it's, they'll, and the problem is they don't know what they don't know. So, you know, you've got this vicious circle about they think they're doing an okay job, but actually they're just surviving from day to day. And I think you're right. It's the ambition bit that is probably the, the key factor. But one thing is, is sure, is that when you look at businesses that export, they are significantly different. They seem to be a different breed. And uh, although our research is showing that there's one in five businesses are currently exporting, small businesses that is, there's at least that many again that would like to. And the problem with the Brexit process is it's like it's gone into deep freeze. A lot of these people now, I mean, our figures show that 63% would still like to trade in the EU, even under the current circumstances. But their decision will be not to invest, to stay the size they currently are if they can't find markets that they can reasonably easily access. So it is a problem. Brexit is a problem. Um, but I think there are solutions out there. I know the government's looking at voucher schemes that can try and unplug this. But if I was, if I was to pin my hopes on one thing I think it really is down to leadership and management skills and getting the investment into the people that are running these businesses and giving them the ambition and the skills that will make a difference that's well that's teased up very nicely um, I thought if we do a, a quick round of questions and I'm very mindful of your clock uh, yeah. don't worry um, so if we actually start off with three quick snappy questions gentlemen at the back there Very quickly, uh, jobs of last resort, uh, being entrepreneurs, aren't you just throwing the weight and the risks of uh, what used to be being an employee onto people's shoulders themselves? And doesn't that just mean that uh, people like that look like the four people on the left of the panel and probably like myself and sound like myself are the ones that are going to succeed in this? I'm, I'm, to to yep. uh, I'm an accountant, so uh -huh. I... Just say, I'm an accountant. I'd be interested in knowing what role, if any, you know, accountancy and advisors you've actually had through the process of entrepreneurship, and actually are they properly engaging as a, as a profession to actually provide the support and discussion of finance and, you know, the level of equity and all that advice, which they can give, and I'd just be interested to know how that actually relates in reality to what you see on the ground. And Ralph, could you bear to go straight to the back of the room, to, to the man at the far back in the corner? 
thank you, uh, Johnson, Campbell, Peckham, CLP. Um, apologies if this was mentioned, uh, I came slightly late, but intrigued to hear your thoughts as to the role of the state in terms of investing in innovative technologies and innovative and including <coughs> and in including that in the educational system as well. So just be and uh, particularly actually the role of uh, successful entrepreneurs like yourself what role they can play in including that in the educational system as well and, and, and teaching some of those skills as well. Okay. Yeah, okay. Kick off. Thank you very much. Now we'll have to go straight yeah. after this. But I think that's, so I think the question with regard to um, whether entrepreneurialism is just be, is just putting it onto the um, to reluctant, if you like, entrepreneurs. I think that I, I, I think that's a great question, but it's a different question. I think here we're talking about celebrating people who who want to grow their companies. We do also need to talk about what kind of companies they are and where they end up. And what you, I think, what you're talking about is the the phrase that I, I hate it. To, it's the gig economy, but it's actually a land grab by um, companies, by businesses, of ta taking the, the risk, the, fant you know, the amazing, you know, the risk that uh, Giles um, has, left, has, has lived with and putting it on, um, cons you <coughs> putting it on individuals. So Uber, uh, so talk about Uber. Uber without, without the upside, right? Without, without the equity ownership upside. Without, yeah, sorry, exactly, without the upside. I, I didn't mean the oh, the what did you mean? I don't think it's about being ex lauding that as, as the solution to uh, the problem of young people not being able to get jobs. I, I, I sorry, we're not lauding. I'm not lauding it as a solution to the problem of young people not being able to get jobs. That comes to the question about what the state can do. But I think if somebody, it's not the people. If some, it shouldn't. If somebody wants to set up their own company, I don't think it's that you were expected to set up your own company. I think you wanted to. If somebody wants to set up their own company, then I will celebrate that because I do think that innovation and you know uh, great new ideas, new companies, and new jobs come from people setting up their own companies. And so I think it's I think it's a good idea, but it shouldn't be a requirement. And I think when you have when you force people sort of off the um, off the unemployment uh, statistics and into so-called um, entrepreneurial um, activities that is a problem and that is a challenge and so in terms of what the state can do um, and I, I think um, our work is very much um, influenced uh, industrial strategy is very much influenced by the work of Mariana Mazzucato who has shown and she does a great example with the iPhone which actually I don't have because Apple don't pay their taxes so you know but um, our, uh, the iPhone how much of the technology um, is um, it came from, for example, the uh, defence um, government defence contracts in Silicon Valley, and how much of Silicon Valley has been um, benefited from the role of the government? And the US is actually really good at having an active government role. Look at DARPA and other uh, other um, uh, agencies, which are there, if you like, to support innovation and new companies. And what we need to do is to be more. We do. We need, to, we, need, we need an entrepreneurial state which can do more to support innovation, and that's why one of our missions in our industrial strategy is to build an innovation nation, increasing um, funding for R&D, and also democratizing that. So it isn't only the big players and the, uh, you know, the universities and the big companies who benefit from R&D, um, investment, but it does change, transform the nature of jobs. So we have more high skill, high wage, high high productivity jobs. And just finally, you know, because the examples you give, uh, Google, I think it's Google, Amazon, uh, what they have actually got in common um, is consolidation and absence of competition. They have monopolised their markets. And that is a failure of regulation. It's a failure of, co it's a failure of competition. It's a failure of regulation. And I, for one, do not believe that uh, the people, well, the people of Europe at any rate, will continue to stand for mega monopolies um, and the absence of true competition. And the you know, uh, mega monopolies whose, whose, whose revenues is based on your data and your content. Well, Charlie, you would have been very, <laughs> you would have been very proud of us yesterday. We were talking about disruptive technology and one of the things that I emphasized was that our concern 
shared by President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, is the mm -hmm. way in which innovation and patents were being used in a f f to yes, create. Yes. Uh, there's always an element. Really good at that. There's always an element of natural monopoly with a patent that is desirable, and we're prepared to go along with it. But it was over and above w what the public welfare may be. Yeah, because it's in combined with networks, and networks have a tendency to uh, consolidate and monopolise. You know, energy. Uh, etc. Unless they are properly regulated, okay. right? And with that, no, thank you very, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um. Yeah, yeah, happy to. Yeah. Maybe, but perhaps a little bit of. I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious of the important role of the your own accountant. Yeah. My own accountant sorted me out 20 years ago. I would never have managed without being sorted. Well, I think when we've surveyed members. Uh, and small businesses, it's very common. Um, who do they trust for a sound advice? It is accounts. You know, they do see them as a, the backbone of external advice. The problem is, it's very rarely, uh, a, it's very rare that accounts will see their role as a forward-looking thing, where they're trying to get, you know, forward plans and ambitious plans. In fact, they positively shy away from any kind of risk that they may have to share. So I think they, uh, they have an important role, uh, and sometimes that role is about, you know, uh, we entrepreneurs get a bit carried away with our lack of uh, understanding of risk, and they, uh, they, they sometimes rein that back in. But, you know, generally speaking, I don't think they help in what we're describing, which is giving people uh, the balls, frankly, to go for the big risk. Marcus. Yeah, I'm just building on that. So, well, I think that there's also a regional element to this. I mean, I think one of the things that we've got in the UK is some, you know, I know it's an overused term, but some ecosystems that work very well. Um, you know, people talk about you know, Oxford, Cambridge, you know, actually um, you know, Newcastle, um, Manchester, where you know, there are groupings of very successful companies, um, investors, and an advisory com community that supports growing businesses. And I think in, in some of those places, actually, whether it's the accountants, the lawyers, or the, or the other professional advisors, perform a very important function. Um, and you know, they, they, they can be um, you know, very important mental supporters, um, people who can actually signpost other contacts. But I think there is a bit of a risk that sometimes those ecosystems become sort of self-reinforcing. And we've certainly seen in some parts of the UK that you know, if the, the dominant type of transaction, for example, is that a business is sold quite early on, then it might be that the lawyers, the accountants, kind of know how to do that and are sometimes reluctant to, to suggest you know, a, a different form of transaction or even have a concern that if for example, they recommended an IPO that they might lose business to, or, or perception they'd lose business to London. So, you know, I think there is still a lot more to be done in terms of kind of educating actually not just um, management teams and entrepreneurs, but also the advisory community. And I mean, we heard earlier about, you know, actually from a government-led perspective, um, some of the support mechanisms that used to exist, like Business Link, have gradually sort of been dismantled and you know we would say that some of the the local growth hubs actually could play a much greater role because we've seen areas like you know Bristol Manchester where the, the local growth hubs have actually been a great way of just signposting um, advisors that can help and can support and can help to bring investors into a region uh, this the, the, the comment I'm going to make now doesn't relate to um, moving <laughs> companies into getting bigger. But certainly for people starting their own business and working on their own, as well as your accountant, you, you do not, you'll find the inland revenue very helpful. I mean, the revenue authorities get knocked a lot, but I can promise you, and I think most financial practitioners would uh, agree, that if you approach the revenue, they will be very helpful as well. Now, I think we've got to try... Can I just jump, jump into yep. that? I mean, there's an interesting point there, that actually the revenue have got a data set that's probably richer than anyone else. And so they can see through companies' returns, you know, actually how companies are developing. And so some very easy sort of technology to signpost businesses, to identify them through tax returns and say, actually, we've noticed that, 
you know, your turnover, your profit, whatever, has increased significantly. Um, you know, have you thought about contacting you know, such and such an agency for, for help? It can actually have quite a big impact. And of course the Digital Economy Act will mean that much of that data is going to be available to the ONS and more use is going to be made within, within a government. I think we should attempt to answer the question about the caricature of the entrepreneurs. <laughs> I didn't really understand that question. Um, shall, but I, shall, shall I have a go? Yeah. See if I've caught it right. You're suggesting that maybe um, ex talking about how more people can become entrepreneurs and it's not just sort of misfits, uh, it's getting into a gig economy that can replace other forms of business activity and other forms of labour market. Uh, that's as I understand it. And expecting people not to graduate from university and have lots of employment instead just telling them, get on your bike and start yes. talking yourself. I, my, my, own, yeah, my own answer to that would be, I, actually, I don't think anyone talking about how do we actually get more entrepreneurs starting businesses and picking them up and having the sort of chat spur and ambition of, I'm going to do a billion, mate, um, is the same thing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a totally separate uh, addition. I think it's quite interesting, uh, the, the cultural change that takes place in Britain. I mean, when I was much younger at university and at school, no one in their right mind would have been talking about actually leaving a good university and, and trying to start your own business. It, the, the tram lines were very, very uh, uh, precise. So is that a... Definitely was the case for me as well, but I think the internet, as I said, the internet's cha changed that. But my worry, I think, is in 20, 30 years' time, uh, the a lot of the opportunities that came about as a result of the internet and kind of the disruption that that that, that brought along will have been sewn up. So you know, you're crazy if you start an online bookstore right now. You're crazy if you start a search engine. You're crazy if you do a bunch of other th start a taxi app. I mean, you know, these things have been will have been done in the same way that. You know, <clears throat> traditional businesses end up becoming pseudo monopolies or oligopolies or whatever. So I think we're in a golden age of of opportunity. Uh, so I think it's a good time to be an entrepreneur, whether you choose to or not, is is your choice, right? Um, as regards what we can do to help uh, people coming out of school and university with more jobs, well, that has to be just be become more successful as an economy, and and uh, you know that's outside. That's a few grades above my pay level, unfortunately. I, I think um, actually there is quite a serious um, part of our national conversation about school, um, further and higher education and work, which is, I think there are a number of people, I would say, think hard about your choice between university and doing other things. Think if you would like to actually have certain skills, like say being a heating engineer, where you may have the chance of actually starting your own business. Um, and it's getting the, inform the practical information about the kind of work streams you could get involved in, how much it costs to get the training, and indeed the kind of incomes you might get out of it, which is jolly hard to navigate when you're not going down the university route. But I think we should have another round of questions, and I've already found my first one. I've got, I've got, I've got an answer to the question, the guy that's actually left now. Um, what about universities, and how can we uh, join them up more to, to growing UK PLC? For me, I think I think we've completely screwed up there compared to say the U.S. I was saying on the call that we have had to prep for this um, that Google came out of Stanford University. The first three years of Google's life was in Stanford University on their premises with their computers, with their bandwidth, all paid for by Stanford. And Larry Page and Sergey Brin were also um, had had grants to do their PhDs. So, so Google funding came out of Stanford University and then when they turned it into a company Stanford gave them the IP right and then 10 20 30 years later they're built they're putting massive amounts of money back into the university so the maybe that's you know Stanford can afford to do that because they're very well established there's a lack of um, there's a lack of appetite for UK universities which are publicly funded and which create enormous amounts of interesting IP to actually say, go take that IP and monetize it. Turn that into a, a British or business. Is that because they want to hang on to the internet? I think it, rights. Uh, uh, partly, yeah. and partly because the, the successes, ha the Google successes haven't happened, so they, ha they, ha they can't see that actually there will be a return for them, but they're gonna have to wait a while. Um, and partly it's not really their motivation. Their motivation is to you know research and development rather than monetize. So I just think that 
we've got some of the best universities in the world, not just Oxford and Cambridge, there are dozens of them, and we have screwed up massively in not taking that IP and, and helping British entrepreneurs actually create businesses and value and wealth and jobs for everybody uh, as a result of it. So I, I, I'm, and so I, I think that's a, that's a, a fuck up. I'm going to follow on from uh, the, the comments there. Uh, Brian Gammish, Cheshire and Amersham, uh, CLP. Um, what does the panel think we need to do to build the culture that's actually going to foster these scaling businesses that you're talking about? Because we've not addressed that yet. Um, Giles just talked about uh, Stanford University, which I know well. Um, people who, ha who develop, when they want to come out and then set up the company, they know exactly where to go to get their funding. They go up Sand Hill Road in, in, uh, in Palo Alto, which is where all the venture capitalists are based. And many of those venture capitalists and the people running those venture capital funds are the people who came out of the previous generation of successful tech companies. Giles already alluded to the fact that at a certain point you've had enough, you want to do something else. So it should be people like Giles who get involved in our next venture capital organization that supports the setting up of businesses. Um, There's uh, a lack of joined up thinking. I agree, hopefully I will. So but, it's, it's, but it's culture, if I can. It, it, it's culture that we need to build here across the organizations. And yes, we should have state involvement in that to set up the venture capital funding, the investment bank we talked about, but it should be feeding back in, and the people who succeed should want to go back in and help the next generation succeed, and then we build something that will carry us through all of this technology change. Uh, I, I agree, I just want one point on that. The danger, okay, so there's what, I totally agree with everything you just said, and hopefully I will get the opportunity to re-contribute in, in, in due course. The, the danger is the localization effect that that has. So Silicon Valley is insanely wealthy, you go 20 miles inland and you've got people sleeping on the street. So, so it's like the, 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 there's, it's going to polarize. <laughs> so, so that's another problem that this will create, which is a massive polarization of, of success in very deep clusters. Um, that's the way to create massive success, but there are knock-on consequences. Clusters fix skills that don't fix the access to information and knowledge. We have the internet for that, right? Yeah. Right, two more questions for this round. Gentlemen. Uh, you will be magnified in a moment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, I come late. Um, I might have missed some. Uh, I mean, UK got uh, Google's and Amazon like Tim Bernard-Lee was from UK. I'm mean, given the like uh, 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 Labour Party uh, 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 like uh, uh, abolishing tuition fees if they come into power, things like that will go a long way. And also another aspect, personal experience. Our children go to coding classes up and down the country, go to dojo, raspberry pi, things like that. These, these things should be more encouraged. Um, a lot of young talent coming up, uh, hopefully in future. And uh, places like Cambridge University, they did a lot of incubation for biotech, but nothing of substance in terms of IT or maybe even biotech of limited role. I don't know what experience you have. Third, another question this round? I wonder about the area for more explicit government support. I'm drawing on my own experiences in my mm -hmm. last job, which was working with the cultural sector to develop an open data platform. And every time I went to talk to a cultural institute, they thought the ideas were great, but they didn't have the resources uh, to, to uh, look at the... Um, uh, the, the data work necessary because they were just too small. I think this exists uh, all over, uh, not just in the cultural sector, but all over different sectors of the UK, especially in the public sector, where government needs to give explicit targeted support on um, helping hire people. We, I talked to a cultural sector organisation recently who just lost its entire uh, digital department because they'd all been poached by uh, uh, private company because they're all offered ten thousand pound pay rises overnight. So I think there is uh, explicit government support that can be done um, to fire up uh, digital um, activity in the in the public sector as well as supporting the private sector. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, I'll, pick, I'll pick up the education point because I think uh, I, I think you made the point earlier that universities could play a much bigger role in this, and obviously the state can do a lot to create the culture that I think would, would uh, encourage that. But the, um, there, there will need to be a massive change in the mentality of a lot of uh, universities and the way in which they're currently operating. I mean, the, and I don't see any initiatives coming from government at the moment that's going to make that happen. So I think this really needs, I suppose, Joe Johnson to step up to the plate and try and make something happen as far as his briefs concerned uh, within Bayes and the university sector. Yeah, I mean, 
I think the risk in a session like this is to always kind of focus on the negatives and, and, and the, the problems and the challenges. And, and I think you know we, we do need to be really mindful of some of the successes that we started to have in the UK. And you know, some of these changes are not going to happen overnight. I mean, you, you were talking about you know Silicon Valley and, and the, the impact of the ecosystem there. And that's taken a long time to grow and develop. You know, we are seeing it in, in areas like Oxford, Cambridge. You know, we, when it comes to the university commercialisation point, you know, I, mean, I completely accept you know, Giles's um, point about um, Stanford. But you know, actually, you know, we are seeing um, vehicles that are being set up in the UK to really help not just provide finance, but you know, people like Imperial Innovations, um, IP Group, you know, now Touchstone, generating and, and putting capital into universities, but also supporting that with knowledge and, and helping universities to commercialise and to put the management skills in alongside the finance. And you know, we're also seeing, I think, because the universities have had to think more over the last 10 years about their future funding, we are starting to see gradually some of the changes um, happening there to the point that actually you know, from a public markets perspective we've seen US university commercialisation vehicles come an IPO or float on the London Stock Exchange because there's a peer group developing in the UK that actually doesn't exist in the US so we are starting to see you know, some, some of those real sort of benefits um, but there clearly needs to be more. More needs to be done. And I think you know, that sort of culture of aspiration and actually not kind of bashing successful companies, to, but but really you know promoting promoting them and getting behind some of our success stories is something that we can also do more of. Yeah, you know, and it, I mean it's interesting that in this session we've talked a lot more actually about. You know, aspiration, skills. Because they're getting people. off the ground rather than the getting the bigger, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you know, we'd been here five years ago, we'd have been talking purely about the finance <laughs> elements. And so I think that again is a demonstration that some of the financing elements have started gradually to take care of themselves. And, and unfortunately, you know, we're talking about angel finance, super angels, <laughs> rather than big you know, private equity funds and hopefully there are elements of the industrial strategy, the patient capital review that will start to, to deal with those because I think you know, we just need to scale up and turbocharge the, the, the size and the scale of some of the funds that exist in the UK and also you know, we, there is a, you know, what might be a bit of a dull element here but there's a tax element and a regulatory element that is really important. You know, for those of you that aren't aware of this, you know, debt is tax deductible, equity is taxed four times. So you know, there is a huge tax imbalance in the system. And also you know, a big regulatory imbalance. I and mean, I talked earlier about you know, some of the UK's insurers have got £1.8 trillion pounds worth of capital on their balance sheet. And if you talk to some of the, you know, the, the, the managers in these um, big pension funds or insurers, they will say to, to you, actually, we would love to be able to invest in the next generation of companies because you know, they want to invest in healthcare, biotech, particularly the pension funds, because they know that people who are going to be taking pensions are going to get older, and so they need to be investing in the technology, the science, that's supporting these businesses, but they're prevented from doing so because of regulation, because of things like solvency and you know, regulatory barriers to, um, to you know, the, the caps on the, the, the size of companies that they can invest in. So we shouldn't lose sight of those elements. Well. No, I, I think this business about the lack of equity capital, the so-called, um, it's been around, the worry has been around for a good 40 years. It used to be described as the thin capitalization uh, challenge. And of course, in that 40 years, it's got worse because the 
tax advantages of the debt haven't been diminished, if anything, they've probably been slightly enhanced, and the uh, double taxation of equity has actually uh, been substantially increased through the movement to a classical uh, corporation tax system done by Conservative and Labour governments in the 1990s. This is a bipartisan policy that's um, probably well, done damage to the structure of uh, taxation. Well, what do you country. mean by the double taxation well, rate this, or the quadruple all, taxation well, rate? In principle, this, 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 the, the great insight for this comes from John Stuart Mill. When we abolished the Corn Laws in the 1840s, we had to get a new source of revenue uh, because the customs was relied on for revenue. So the wartime taxation of income tax was revived. And he wrote his book the, um, on political economy in 1846. And he was the first economist to notice that if you tax income, effectively you have double taxation of savings income. And this always is inherent in an income tax system. And that capital is double taxed, and therefore people accumulate less uh, capital. So, so you have tax on the gain on the capital and the income, and as, you, income yeah. as you draw it down. And then if you actually have a corporation tax regime, you potentially have uh, the capacity for uh, uh, treble taxation of income from capital held in the form of uh, equity. Now, one way around that is to have a very complex system of um, offsets uh, that Jim Callaghan brought in in the 1960s, uh, which had some technical problems, but was a very good way of getting through it. Um, and that was partially got rid of by Norman Lamont, I think, in 1993, and then was completely got rid of by Gordon Brown in 1997. So it's a very good example where we've gone, in, and I see the account at the front nodding uh, along with me. Um, it's a very good example of actually how this, this has been a big problem, even with the arrangements of Jim Callaghan, it was a big problem, um, and we've now gone and made it significantly uh, worse. Um, now, I, th I think there's the question about the digital uh, activities of government departments and not being boosted up enough. Um, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that unless anyone wants to come in on that. Oh, you, you've got the backing of Tim Berners-Lee, so uh, yeah. you know he's all up for open data. Um, uh, the, I think the question is, um, well, there's two questions to my mind. One is the privacy ele element and the other is the value element. You know, how do you, this data is valuable, yeah. um, some more than other. Um, so there's an income stream there, but it's a it's public asset. Skills, no, sorry, no, I work with the other data institute, so I know uh, the, it's all about the government support for the skills necessary to create data which can be shared. I think not all data has to be open. And Tim Burns Lee's point is you open the stuff which enables sharing, but you license the stuff which has value, and there is uh, skills involved in working out which is which. But it's more about providing the skills for actually non-governmental departments, because the GDS does brilliantly, but it's you know, all the sort of uh, her yeah, British Museum all the way down to local council museums and then other equivalent departments where there is enormous value tapped in these institutions which could be shared, could be created, could be released, but there isn't the skills necessary to actually create it. Now, I'm conscious we're coming to the end of the session. I thought I'd ask our panel if there's any particular point that I'd actually like to make before we begin to call it a day. Um, for me, it, it's you know really focusing on creating ambition and, and really highlighting <coughs> the successes that we have. So you know, I think there's probably a learning for us that actually, rather than talking about Google and Amazon, we should have probably selected UK role models. I mean, I'd put the emphasis on leadership and management skills because I think there's a lot of small business owners that if they had the tools, uh, if they had a wider range of skills, would be able to take bigger risks, would be confident enough to back their hunches. And I think that's the, the missing element at the moment. It, there's too many potentially very good business ideas that are really not getting backed. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly with both those things. I'm sorry I was negative. I don't, uh, my default needle is uber positive. Um, <laughs> so I agree that one should always look for the positives rather than the negatives. Um, uh, and that's, that's, I don't really have anything else to add. I think it was what you both said was perfect. And I think that Giles is absolutely right. I'm afraid we've really, the, the shutter's about to come down. I mean, I think that the, the, 
culturally, this issue of ambition and going in there, presenting, bigging yourself up, I think that is a difference between uh, 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 American business culture and our own, and I think that's actually really v very important. There's a moment when you're presenting to investors and you don't want to sound like an Anglican clergyman, clergyman sharing your doubts <laughs> we're, about we're, faith. We're very shy, actually, uh, us Brits, and one of the things that we do in, in our company is every month we have a monthly town hall uh, where the whole company gets together. We've got seven offices, so there's dial-ins from different parts of the world. And every month we uh, volunteer somebody in the company to make a presentation to the entire company. Now they can say no if they want to, but it's very good practice because we don't do it very much in this country. We do, Americans do it the whole time. When I, when I get to see Americans stand up and present, I think every time I think, holy shit, you're amazing. And when a Brit stands up, there's an apology for 10 minutes, <laughs> then a little bit of content, and then a few more apologies, and then walk off. And it's like, no, 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 forget the apologies. You know, let's come forward. So, so I think that, that, that present, present, presenting skills and that self-confidence and that belief, I think it's critical. How do you, how do you teach it? How do you teach self-belief? Incredibly difficult. You have to fake it until you make it, I think, and then it and starts to happen. It. You've got to have a go. Yeah. At it. I mean, the, well, thank you very much indeed. I mean, th th I'm very conscious that the, one of the final questions about um, the use of data. Um, last week, I went to an extremely interesting conference organized by the ONS, and this was concentrating on population statistics and social statistics. And I think that many of us, including me, underestimate the impact of the new Digital Economy Act. And for the first time, the ONS will have access to administrative data uh, from government on tax and other um, things that gives you direct observations on the economy and all sorts of indicators. In the past, they've had to rely on cockeyed surveys, in effect. And this access to the digital data and increasingly to commercial data as well, I think is going to change things a, a great deal, both in our observations about how we think um, the life in our society is actually operating and is going to give businesses opportunities as well. And the other thing which we are very unusual in this country, and it's an artifact of the National Health Service, is we have huge amounts of data on people and health conditions. And that is going to be one of the growing market interests around the world. And probably we have more of it than anybody else. And it's our great challenge um, to actually do something uh, with that. And I hope in that process, we might get naturally uh, whatever the company will be called in the future. But thank you very much for coming here uh, to, to take part in this today. Much appreciated. And if you're interested in it, you might find this uh, document we put out about the new industrial strategy. It's a good read. I think it lays out some of the stuff quite neatly. And you can have a good rake through it and get something out of it if you enjoy today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much.